a bug spreads from China, and Iowa sends a moderate and a progressive candidate on to New Hampshire. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Welcome back. We'll sit down with Zanny Minton Beddoes, editor in chief of The Economist. We are going to talk in this panel about where trade and the climate intersect. And Glenn Hubbard, former Council of Economic Advisors chairman. We're not going to grow our way out of structural deficits. And deputy assistant secretary at the U.S. Treasury. And our special guests, Larry Summers, former U.S. Treasury secretary. And Daniel Tarullo, former member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. It all started out so well, a new year with bright prospects for markets and renewed global growth. But even as we began 2020, there was a virus growing in central China that would soon infect tens of thousands and kill hundreds. And so trade and commerce and travel began to shut down, adding the prospect of reduced economic growth to the tragic human toll. For the first quarter alone, some banks are cutting their first quarter growth expectations for China to as low as 3.8% representing a loss in the tens of billions of dollars so far, and it's not just the first quarter. Economists are cutting full-year growth targets six-tenths compared to last year, down to 5.4 percent. And so we start our program with the economic effects of the coronavirus, with our contributor Zanny Minton Beddoes. She's editor of The Economist, and Glenn Hubbard of the Columbia Business School. Dr. Hubbard served as the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President George W. Bush. So welcome, both of you. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks. Zanny, I'm going to start with you, because last week the cover of The Economist was rather clever. It was a globe with a surgical mask in the form of the Chinese flag on it. Uh, where are we right now in this? What are the economic effects likely to be? Well, we, we don't really know, but my suspicion is that they are going to be quite a lot bigger even than those numbers that you cited. And, and let me tell you why. And I'm very struck how little reaction there has been in markets, particularly this week, um, where I think they've basically kind of shrugged off any, any concerns about the coronavirus. And the reason I worry a bit is that the prism through which many analysts are looking at this is the prism of the SARS virus, which in 2002, 2003 hit China and, and parts of Asia. And the impact then was a very sharp decline in Chinese GDP, but very quick, and then a very dramatic bounce back the following quarter. So by the, when you looked at it over a year, it was a kind of blip. I think there are several reasons why this time is different. One is, as you say, the numbers of people infected are already quite a lot larger. It's traveled further, and we aren't anywhere near the peak yet. We don't know where, how far we are from the peak. But more importantly, China is a very different economy than it was in 2002, 2003. It's much bigger. It, then it was about 4 percent of global GDP. Now it's about 16 percent. It's much, much more integrated into global supply chains. You know, now there are a huge number of global companies that rely on Chinese supply chains, which is why you're seeing car companies outside of China already having to think about shutting down their, their factories well away from Wuhan. And thirdly, it's the Chinese themselves are much, much more mobile. There's mm. much more movement. I was really struck uh, before they shut all the flights down. I think it's 200,000 people go in and went in and yeah. out of China every day. That's six times more than 2002, 2003. So if you put all of that together, I'm not sure that SARS is the right prism through which to think about what the impact will be this time around. And, and Glenn, as Zanny says, the markets just keep going up and up. They took a hit for a couple of days, but they're back up now again. Uh, are the markets getting wrong? And are economists getting wrong? Are economists underestimating the possible effects? Well, I think what economists have done in the market is focus on the near-term GDP effects that you mentioned, and I have no reason to quarrel with those numbers. But I agree with Zanny. First of all, China's starting off at a much weaker economy going into this than was true during SARS. It's, as Zanny pointed out, four times the share of world output that it once was. And the global connections are important. I also think another casualty here is fueling China skepticism mm. around the world, particularly in our own country, uh, that may weaken global supply chains. So I think the market's maybe shrugging a bit too much here. We, we don't know where it's going, Zanny, but is there a risk, perhaps, to the very globalization that makes China a larger part of the world uh, economy? Yeah, I think there is a risk. And don't forget, this is coming on top of what was already a very um, tendentious relationship between the U.S. and China. You know, we did have that phase one trade deal a few weeks ago, which has made everyone sort of heave a sigh of relief. But really underlying that is a shift in both countries to seeing the other as a strategic competitor, a concern about, it, particularly in the technology sphere, that, you know, the, the U.S. desire to not have Huawei and 5G and vice versa. I think that then meant that there's already talk of a splinter net 
net of two different tech ecosystems. Supply chains were already unraveling because of that. You add this on top, and I think you have a, you know, an additional push. And, and the longer it goes on, just imagine all of the Western companies are taking all of their non-essential personnel out of China now. People are moving out. If this goes on for months rather than weeks, I think you have a really profound impact. People will say, can we rely on a Chinese supply chain? What does it do to well, the U.S. economy? Well, I think for the U.S. economy, it will be very modest in terms of a GDP effect in the near term. But again, if global supply chains fracture, that is a big change for business. And don't forget the Chinese economy itself, an uh, internal problem in the Chinese economy or perceived lack of legitimacy of the regime has big global implications. So again, shrug is not what I'd be doing. That, that's another question. What, how, how does Xi Jinping handle this and what is the impact on him? And part of the last few years has been you know, the very, very dramatic centralization of power. It went from being a sort of collective authoritarianism to a one-man authoritarianism. He's got a huge amount at stake. And I think the very, very draconian response, which I think increasingly people are going to question you, is the cost of the response of shut, trying to shut down whole parts of the country sustainable and worth it? And are we going to do this again and again and again? In fact, we have these viruses come up more and more often, I guess particularly in part because the human uh, occupation right. infringes on nature. I mean, you know, and for example, in China, people are saying they're living closer to bats now <laughs> as a practical matter. And so they come into contact with one another. So we're going to have it more and more often. zanny has got a great question. Are we going to take these draconian steps every time? I don't think we can. And, and I think politically the regime would be in trouble if it did. So I, I think these longer-term questions are the one to be focused on, not so much the calculations of GDP. But in the meantime, there are these really interesting kind of butterfly wing consequences. You know, coffee prices tumbling because all the Starbucks is being closed. You know, <laughs> Chilean exports of wine. Right, wine know, and cheese are piling up everywhere. Piling up. For, for the we're going to see more of those because yeah. I think a lot of people aren't really... You know, I, I certainly am not aware of the very details of these supply chains. So there's going to be really surprising consequences. 90% of the world's plastic flowers made in China. Is that right? I didn't know that. So there you yeah, go. so it's another aspect of this uh, globalization as a practical matter because it has effects around the world that we can't even anticipate. Well, that's absolutely true. And of course, right now, globalization has skeptics among elected leaders, including uh, in the United States. And so these all feed that skepticism. Well, this is a fascinating point. It's not just among leaders the globalization has skeptics. You see it in the United States. You see it in Western Europe. There are a lot of people in the populace who say, I'm not sure I like this globalization so much. That's absolutely true. And I'm interested in this country. What happens? Let's, let's just imagine, I hope it doesn't, but let's imagine this goes on for a few months. And let's say we have a bigger outbreak here in the U.S. too. What is the president going to do in terms of his relationship with the Chinese leader and the reaction to China? Because on the one hand, if this is hurting the U.S. economy a lot, it's going to be something made in China that's hurting the U.S. economy, not so great. If, and it's also reinforcing this sense of division between the U.S. and China. So I'm kind of interested. Glenn, what do you think? Where, where, does, it, where does that shape up? Well, I think it certainly would feed the president's skepticism. But let's remember that the president's opponents in this race are as at least That's as skeptical exactly right. as China, if not more so. In fact, he may be the China friend yeah. uh, among them. How about that? OK, our contributors will be staying with us. And you can check out what's coming up next week on Wall Street Week by heading to Bloomberg Market's official Twitter account. We're going to have a poll each week focused on what you'd like to hear from our contributors. The results for this week are in. Do you seek out candidate platforms and economic policies before you vote? 66% of you told us that you do. So we're going to bring in contributor Larry Summers to go through those economic plans. That's next. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. An important part of the Trump economic plan has been its approach to trade, his withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, his signing of a phase one trade deal with China, and negotiation of the USMCA. On each of these, the president differs from various of the Democrats competing for his job, although not necessarily in the way that you might expect. Trump's new NAFTA deal got bipartisan support in Congress, and candidates Biden, Klobuchar, Warren, and Buttigieg all supported it. But Bernie Sanders and Tom Steyer were opposed because of climate concerns. When it comes to China, the candidates are unanimous in their criticism of the president's phase one deal. Former Vice President Biden blasted the deal as a loss for the United States that fails to make headway on the central issue of the trade dispute. Senator Klobuchar has criticized what it's meant for farmers, saying Trump is treating farmers like poker chips in one of his bankrupt casinos. 
But the one place where all the candidates seem to agree with one another and with President Trump is the need for the United States to stop China's unfair trading practices. Though, unlike the president, the Democrats would enlist U.S. allies to get that job done. Just the sort of multilateral approach the president says he cannot live with. The fact is that everybody wants to be where the action is, and the United States of America is indeed the place where the action is. One of the biggest promises I made to the American people was to replace the disastrous NAFTA trade deal. In fact, unfair trade is perhaps the single biggest reason that I decided to run for president. To take us through what's at stake as Democrats sort themselves out, we welcome now Larry Summers, coming to us from Newton, Massachusetts. Zanny Minton Beddoes and Glenn Hubbard are still with us here in New York. So, Larry, thanks so much for joining us. I know that you think that basically any of the Democrats would be better on economic policy than President Trump. But among the Democrats, is there much of a variation? Are there ones that make more sense, ones that make less sense? Look, I think the Democrats are all much better than President Trump. They don't have the same truculence. They don't have the same willingness to give away. They don't have any willingness to give away money uh, to rich people. They don't have the same resisting of alliance. They all recognize that saving the environment is an economic issue, not just an aesthetic issue. And President Trump doesn't understand uh, any of that. In general, I prefer the Democrats who recognize that inequality and fairness are crucial issues, but not the only crucial issues, and who also understand how important it is to grow our economy more rapidly. Because only with a growing economy and a more rapidly growing economy can we afford to provide early, early childhood education for all our kids. Only can we afford enough scientific research to clearly surpass China. Only can we afford to make the necessary investments in renewables to lead the world with respect to climate change. Only with more rapid growth can we raise middle class standards, middle class standards of living at uh, a rapid rate. So I prefer the more moderate uh, Democrats, people like uh, like former Vice President uh, Biden, the candidates whose names begin with B, basically their last uh, <laughs> names, who recognize the importance of having a stronger economy in order to make it possible to do all the necessary public investment and to do all the necessary things to support uh, the middle class. And the approach, uh, frankly, taken by Senator Sanders and uh, Senator Warren that acts like there's no constraint on how much the government can spend, that the government can add up its spending by ten, literally tens of trillions of dollars, that there's no limit to how high the taxes that can be placed on affluent people are, that thinks the only issue is tearing down the people who are most uh, successful. Uh, in our country. Right. Right. I don't think that's nearly as productive uh, an approach. Okay, so let's turn to somebody who served in a Republican administration. What Larry just said, is that a Democratic point of view? Because pro growth for the Democrats? Well, pro growth should be everybody's point of view. It's not a Democratic or Republican phrase. I'm heartened to hear Larry say it. Certainly heartened to hear the attacks on what I would call fairly extreme views from Senator Sanders and Senator Warren. I would give the president a little more credit in economic policy. While he has made some steps that I don't agree with, I think, by and large, the corporate tax plan was very good. His bent towards uh, lighter, smarter regulation, uh, also very good. To me, the real frustration in this campaign is that we're going to talk about very big things like socialism, yes, no, as opposed to really what works. How are we actually going to fix health care? Mm. How are we actually going to have an infrastructure plan? And how do we prepare people for the modern world? Glenn, <laughs> let me take you on a little bit uh, there. There is no evidence of any kind that we have seen any substantial increase in investment because of cutting the corporate tax rate to 21 percent. But we've seen a huge gain to people at uh, the top end. I don't know what the light, smart, 
regulation is, but I'm more worried that we'll get ourselves into financial trouble again sometime in the next several years that I have been uh, any time in a very uh, long time. So I'm disappointed to see you um, while adopting, I think, a, a valid uh, philosophy, endorse the specifics of much of what uh, the president has done. Yeah. I mean, just, cut so corporate one, tax so, rates, I, maybe. Expensing, yeah, so I, I think Glenn, maybe. I think but it's been hundreds of billions of dollars more yeah, expensive yeah. Than, than you thought. Right. I well, think Glenn has an yeah, opportunity just, to respond. Just, yeah, just <laughs> one quick addendum, Larry. I think the early evidence from the corporate tax plan was that investment did go up relative to trend. What has happened is a very large increase in uncertainty, some of it, frankly, due to our own public policies. Uh, but the tax plan itself, I don't think, is the problem. So I've been enjoying watching this, well, uh, this uh, duel no, between, between the uh, two esteemed uh, former members of two administrations. Uh, I, my take, I, I, we can have a long discussion about the uh, merits or otherwise of Trump economic policy. I think, I think there is, there are some uh, good things in it, Larry. I think there has been some tax reform that was useful to have. I think some of the deregulation was probably sensible. I think broadly the size of the fiscal deficit, I'm sure, Glenn, you would agree, is not where one would want a exactly. fiscal deficit right now. And the nature of much of the tax cut also left a lot to be desired. But for me, the striking thing about the Democrats, and we in our cover story this week have called them the repair faction and the radical faction. Mm. The radical faction, obviously, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, uh, the repair oriented moderates um, are the others. I think it's not just the ones beginning with B, actually. I think there's probably somebody beginning with K who might, who might <laughs> want to be <laughs> part of that, too. Um, but for me, the interesting thing is even amongst them, how far the center of gravity amongst what is now the moderates in the Democratic Party is to the left Very of much. where, you know, certainly President Clinton was and President Obama was on many areas. So the scale of the spending plans, the attitude to trade, which I think is really, really interesting. Trade skepticism is now entrenched um, in the Democratic Party and trade skepticism towards China is probably stronger, actually, there um, than even, or at least as strong as President Trump. There's not much daylight yeah. there. Perhaps it would be, you know, more desire to work multilaterally, but the skepticism is absolutely there. Larry, you worked under both President Obama and President Clinton. Do you agree with Zanny in saying the entire center has moved to the left from where they were? I think events have changed the position of all economists. You know, Zanny, one thing you said I don't I don't agree with when uh, Only one? the W when China was <laughs> when China was admitted into the WTO, there were about 200 Republican votes in the House of Representatives and 40 and 40 votes, if that, on the Democratic side. So. Right, wrong, good, bad, the Democrats have been skeptical about trade for a long time. And the big change has actually been that the Republicans from the business community, who used to be proponents of trade, have now moved under President Trump's uh, influence in a massively protectionist uh, direction. I think, as any economist has written many times about abnormally low interest rates, secular stagnation, and the need to think differently about uh, fiscal policy. And I think all economists have moved on that, including Democratic uh, economists. And you could call that a left-wing move. The Economist has written about the need to do much more than we realized was necessary a decade or two about global climate change. And Democratic economists have heard that message and have moved. Yes, that's a move to the left, but it's not some kind of ideological thing. It's a reflection of changing conditions, including widening inequality. Right. Yeah, I, I wasn't suggesting it was necessarily a bad thing, but there, I, I'm just struck at how, you know, dramatic that move has been and how actually, you know, what is the center of gravity of the party is now not where it was, frankly, even for, you know, six years ago, never mind, you know, 16 years ago. So I think, it, I think there has been a change. And if you look at the sort of scale of some of the spending plans, they're very dramatic. But what's really striking is the appeal of the radicals, if you will, and the, and the really, really dramatic shift, not just in the sort of scale of the climate plans and so forth, but in the appropriate role for government in the U.S. economy. That You have serious candidates for the Democratic nomination now basically arguing that, you know, not just that, you know, in large companies, 
you should have substantial worker representation on boards, but you should be taking shares and putting them in trust for workers. This is these are policies that Jeremy Corbyn was pushing yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, you know, they have echoes here now on this side of the Atlantic, and it's it's just um, striking to me how how big that shift has been and. You know, it, it may well be, we'll see yeah. what happens in the next few months, but it may well be that, that, that somebody from that side, from the radical side, gets the nomination. And in fairness, uh, that's what I heard Larry sort of suggested at the beginning, that there are some people that are, are a little bit too far for him as well. Many thanks to Larry Summers from Newton, Massachusetts. We're going to be back with our contributors. And we should note, Michael Bloomberg is also seeking the Democratic nomination for president. Bloomberg is the founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're back with our contributors now. We're going to ask them what caught their eye. And I know, Glenn, you were particularly taken by the fact that the British government appears to be changing their position towards internal combustion engines. Yes, there was a, an announcement of an aspiration to phase out internal combustion engines for sale by 2035 instead of 2040. And in concert with all the stories recently about stranded assets and climate change, it just strikes one that the pace of this may move more quickly than people think. And it may be quicker in Europe than it, it is here definitely be quicker in uh -huh. Europe than it is here. I think one of the striking things, and every time I cross the Atlantic now, is how big the, the difference is between the focus in Europe on climate and here. And here it's changing, but in Europe it's really changing. This is absolutely front and center on, on the European political agenda. Glenn, and one of the things I hear time and time again is that may, may address the fiscal issues in Europe uh, through the green process, that in fact investment will be required and that will actually help the growth over there. Does that make sense? I think it does. I mean, a carbon tax can also be part of a fiscal reform for the United States too. So we know how to do this. The question is just getting the consensus behind it. But I don't think the discussion's absent in the U.S. Many prominent investors like BlackRock have really weighed in on this in a very serious way. They have. And, and it certainly is now ESG is, is it, I think, becoming for real um, in boardrooms around the world. I think that's really interesting. One question is, how does that translate into sort of meaningful change beyond the financial community? And I think one place to look would be what happens through the financial sector regulation? Is that are the central banks? You know, Mark Carney, the former the governor of the Bank of England, has been pushing this very hard. That may be somewhere I think we see real change. The UK is obviously going to be the host for the next COP meeting this year. That's going to be a very, very big priority. I think this is, you're right, this is an area where there's traction, but there's obviously a big difference when you've got a government that is, a federal government that is really not paying any attention whatsoever. Exactly. That's the big difference. Yeah. If you look at Europe and the United States, we're talking about the government in Europe doing this. We're talking about a private industry actually, if anything, doing it despite the government, in the face of the government. Can it really work in this country without the government getting behind it? No. I mean, in the long run, we're going to have to have some sort of price on carbon. And so, no, that's a public policy matter. Corporations can't solve it. But I do think the American business community is very heavily engaged as are American investors. So I wouldn't count out the political class some. just yet. I, I think it's less, I mean, there is, there are some are very, very heavily engaged, but I think not everybody on this side of the Atlantic. There are definitely some who think growth is what it's all about. Right. This economy is doing very, very well. It's dynamic. Those Europeans, they're not even growing and they're focused <laughs> on the climate. I mean, I've heard that. Okay. So, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get too complacent about what's going on here. Okay, we will be back with our contributors. And coming up next, Dan Tarullo. He's former Federal Reserve Board of Governors member. He's going to be joining us right here. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Welcome back from New York. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week, and I'm David Weston. Over 200 years ago, Benjamin Franklin said that it was work that makes us happy. But now, for the first time in history, we run the risk of running out of those jobs that make us so happy. According to an Oxford economic study from last year, the world stands to lose millions of jobs to automation, with China potentially having the most to lose, as many as 12.5 million over the next decade, followed by 2 million lost in Europe and 1.5 million in the United States. It's the lower-skilled workers and the poorer 
local co economies that may take the biggest hit, at least initially. But none of us should be feeling too complacent. It turns out that those holding bachelor's degrees are particularly vulnerable, and some of the most sophisticated and highest paying jobs may go the way of the buggy whip maker. So the next time you complain about having to roll up your sleeves, you might want to take a look over your shoulder to see if there's some contraption that doesn't need sleeves waiting to take your place. To talk about what technology may mean for jobs, we welcome now Daniel Tarullo of Harvard. Dan was the member of the Board of Governors responsible for regulating financial institutions. And our contributors, Zanny Minton, Beddows, and Glenn Hubbard are still with us. So, Dan, I know you've taken a real hard look, particularly at artificial intelligence, what it means for jobs in the United States, for the workplace. What have you concluded? Well, I haven't, I'm not sure I've concluded much, David, other than to believe that it's an issue that has been underappreciated and underanalyzed in public policy terms. And I think there are three sorts of considerations here. First is the potential sheer magnitude of the impact. That is, as you noted a moment ago, uh, may well be millions, and I've seen estimates that are not alarmist estimates that go well above a couple of million. Secondly, that those losses will not just be at the lower end of the wage scale, but could go all the way up to what we now think of as professional jobs, contributing to a further hollowing out of the middle in the American and other mature economies. Second consideration is that even if you take a fairly optimistic view of where this all may end up, that is, the technology will end up creating as many jobs as it eliminates, as has been the case in the past, the transition may be an extremely difficult one. You know, we think transition temporary, therefore it's kind of okay. But if a transition is long enough and if it's dramatic enough, there can be permanent scars to the people who lose their jobs, but I think also to the, to the economy as a whole. You know, Bill Gates is no technophobe. He's the furthest thing from it, but he's expressed concern about the pace of the change. And the third consideration, I think, is the intersection of the economics and the politics. You know, since, uh, if you go back to the enclosure movement and the early industrial revolution in Britain, when there is substantial displacement that has a social as well as an economic effect, there is a high correlation with political mm. uh, consequences, including um, more polarization, more disaffection, uh, more movement away from the center towards more dramatic alternatives. And, and I think, to some degree, we saw, we've seen some of that in this country. I mean, the, we lost almost 20 percent of manufacturing jobs in the United States in the decade before the financial crisis. I'm from Flint. Tell me about exactly. it. Exactly. And, and I think, uh, you, we don't know for a fact, obviously, but I think there's a pretty good chance that those losses at the pace, the pace of the losses, the sense of, of, um, of being displaced had contribute, has contributed to the polarization and the disaffection that we, that we see today. Glenn, you've done some work in this area. I, I have, and, and let me agree with Dan. I do think this is a huge problem and our political class isn't that aware, but let's start with some good news too. The artificial intelligence movement will enable people to be far better at many of their jobs. It complements the skills of many workers at the top uh, and the bottom, hopefully not replacing economics professors uh, <laughs> in, the, in the middle of that. But we're not really prepared. You know, uh, Dan mentioned Bill Gates. Bill Gates' idea was taxing robots. We don't need to build walls against the future, what we need to do is build bridges to it. And so we need to help people get ready. But our public policies are stuck in a labor market set of policies from the 1930s. They're not ready for today. And there I really agree with Dan. So I, oh, this is going to be a very dull conversation because like we're all going to agree, but, <laughs> but uh, two perspectives on this. One is I'm struck actually in the last few years about how more, much more slowly this is happening than people were anticipating. The, the study you cited at the beginning of this segment had a kind of an earlier version, which I think right. came out in 2013, an Oxford study that caused a huge stir that I think said 47 percent mm -hmm. of jobs were vulnerable to being automated within the next couple of decades, cited thousands of times. And that, and that really started the robots are about to take all of our jobs meme. If you actually look what's happened to labor markets in the last few years, we have unemployment at record lows across the rich world. We have employment at record highs in many places. And this is not all, you know, gig jobs. It's not all terrible jobs. It's actually sustainable, real jobs. And so I think it's happening much more slowly. And I'm sort of comforted that, uh, as Glenn said, in the end, history, every time we've had a technological innovation, 
has created jobs as well as destroying them. In fact, more of the creation than of the destruction. But where you're completely right is that the transition for particular people who don't have the right skills for the new kinds of jobs are, are traumatic. And we've definitely seen that over the last 20 years in manufacturing in the US and across the advanced world. And so for me, the, the question is, what do we do about it? And the lesson historically is that the US did it so much better 100 years ago in the last yeah. big industrial revolution, because you had a revolution in education at the same time. You had the un creation of universal secondary education, in a sense, provided people with the skills they needed when they came off the land to work in factories. And we haven't had that revolution in education and training now, and we need it. Right. Well, and Dan, it strikes me, employment's very, very high, unemployment's very, very low, but wages have not increased the way we would have thought, given that employment situation. How much of that is being suppressed, actually, by technology? Uh, it's surely technology is playing a role. It's it, uh, surely globalization has played a role as well. Um, I think where I probably disagree some with both Glenn and Zanny is is more predictive than factual. But I'm skeptical about the capacity of public policy to manage um, a truly substantial displacement, even over a trans transitional period. I, I don't think we did a very good job at all with trade displacement. And trade displacement itself could be um, uh, smallish compared to what happens in technology. Zanny makes an important point. There, there, the tendency towards alarmism, towards getting your tweet and all, I think is probably exaggerated. Certainly, the um, point at which we'll have a kind of critical mass of job losses and maybe even the eventual magnitude of it. But when you think when it's not just individuals, but whole groups of people, whether it's geographic communities or right. um, classes of people, I don't I don't think that a system that's set up more or less for individual assistance is actually going to be but, particularly but, but efficacious. To me at least that raises two questions. What should we do about it and how do you pay for it? Well, that, so the, the what you should do about it, I mean, this this issue that where David and I started speaking about this issue was exactly around the campaign, with our saying, yeah. you know, what's not being talked about. And I, Andrew Yang has talked about it some, that the leading candidates have not. I suspect part of the reason is they don't have a great solution. You know, to the degree that it intersects with trade, and it will intersect with trade, particularly with trade and services, I think that one political response is going to be further constraint on on mm. globalization. But I don't think, you know, how do you how do you deal with a progressive development of AI that is not closing down factories? That's unlikely to be the way it, it plays out. Instead it will be within ongoing businesses you'll have a displacement. Well, I think that there are things that we could be doing. Uh, Austin Goolsby and Penny Pritzker and I suggested a block grant for community colleges, which are the workhorses for these training programs. And something I used to be quite skeptical of, but I'm a little bit less so today, place-based aid, actually going into communities uh, for income relief, for right. shoring up those communities' capacity to cope with change. If we don't do this, I worry, as Dan does, that we're going to wreck the social fabric that underlies change and the golden goose of our economic system. Well, look, I think, I think it, it is hard to overstate how dysfunctional the U.S. political environment is right now, and thus how unlikely the U.S. is to be a place where this is catalyzed. I agree with you in terms of one of the areas where we have had, where I also have changed my view is the, is the whole question of left behind areas and place based aid. Because it used to be a view that you'd think, well, people would move to where the dynamic new jobs were. And I think we underestimated the kind of corrosive impact of a really large scale hit to particular geographic areas. Interestingly, that's actually an area where the UK is now doing a huge, great experiment. Boris Johnson's leveling up agenda, which is the sort of big post Brexit agenda for the UK, is very much about helping the region. So, you know, as in 1979, maybe, you know, Britain will forge some new social contract and we can, you know, export it back to you. But the, the bit that I think is less likely, I don't think it's going to be, well, there's already protectionism in the US, but the area that worries me where I think you will simply see a slowing of the technological change. So, for example, one of the, the examples people always use is truck drivers. Yes. Right now, you can't get enough truck drivers in this country, but it is a, an industry where those people who think robots will take our jobs say, well, within, you know, a decade, there'll be no more jobs for truck drivers. If that were really to be the case, I think there would be huge political pressure simply to stop driverless trucks, and we would just be preventing progress that way. That, that's my that question. Really is, that is the center, though, I think. It's, that's the issue, 
on that uh, the, where the politics may be fought out in the not too distant future. That is, is there going to be an effort to intervene directly to at least slow down the source and pace of the change? Or is there going to be more or less complete reliance on adjustment mechanisms? And that's why I was making the point earlier that adjustment mechanisms, at least in the United States, have proven woefully inadequate have we to ever deal done it? with trade have issues. We ever done it well? Have we ever done it well? No. No. Uh, not, not in a well-organized fashion, no. And, and what we've done is to put enormous pressure on the few sets of programs that exist. The best example, I think, is disability insurance. Disability insurance was not designed to deal with 55-year-old people who have lost a job right. and are not totally disabled. But that's the only thing that exists, which is why you have an entire industry of people who are on late-night TV saying they can get you a full disability claim. Okay. Okay. The irony, of course, is that the very technology which we're worried about displacing the jobs is what we need to harness yes. in order to help retrain people. But there's a, I agree with that, but there's a lot of intertemporal... There are a lot of intertemporal problems there. There's the skills mismatch, there's the geographic mismatch, which you mentioned, Zanny, and I think there may well also just be the job creation mismatch. That is, the jobs may be lost sooner and the new sets of jobs coming on a bit later. Last thought, the, the other irony is political. We're in a presidential yeah. campaign. Neither side is picking this up. The voters' anxiety would seem heavily correlated with President Trump's views and voters, yet we're probably not seeing as much as we should. On the left, the talk is Medicare for all, not helping people change. Okay, many thanks to Dan Tarullo. Our contributors will be staying with us. And if you missed an episode of Bloomberg Wall Street Week, full episodes are now available on YouTube, the Bloomberg Terminal, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. After an epic six-day rally, Elon Musk's fortune is coming back down to earth, at least a little bit. Stock in Musk's electric car company tumbled on Wednesday, the most in eight years. Even before the plunge, investors and analysts were skeptical of Tesla's market value. Steve Eisman, the investor made famous by The Big Short, told Bloomberg Television the recent run-up in Tesla is inexplicable. Look, everybody has a pain threshold, and, you know, when a stock becomes unmoored from valuation because it has certain dynamic growth aspects to it and has cult-like aspects to it, you have to just walk away. Instead, Eisman remains bullish about General Motors, calling it, quote, reality on the ground. I spoke to GM CFO Divya Siradavara this week about the automaker's strategy to keep up with Tesla's dominance in electric vehicles. We're all in on EVs, and uh, the way uh, we're demonstrating that we have a number of key vehicle launches coming. Uh, you saw the Hummer EV announcement recently, um, and we have a number of other additional strong products that are com coming as well. We're taking this seriously. We've made meaningful investments in this area. We have scale. We have multiple brands and segments where we're able to leverage our one flexible architecture and go all in. Zanny Minton Beddoes and Glenn Hubbard are back with me. So, Zanny, uh, I hear people say what Mr. Eisman said, which is you can't possibly justify these valuations. I hear other people say you ain't seen nothing yet, that actually Tesla's going to go way, way further. So, which is it? Look, who knows? I mean, I think I'm probably more in the former. I, f I find it quite hard to justify these valuations, but I think... You know, Tesla is not thinking of that. Elon Musk certainly doesn't think of this as a car company. This right. is a transformational technology that's going to accelerate the, whatever it is, the move to a sustainable world. And for a long time, he really failed to deliver, right? They had terrible production problems. There was lots and lots of talk about, you know, where they're going to run out of cash. And we have had some good news recently. You know, that factory, that gigabyte factory in, in China opened yeah. very, very fast. He's, you know, turning a... He's making some money. Production is coming online. And I think if all things come together, it is true that unlike the legacy car companies, he doesn't have a huge legacy cost of the internal combustion engine. He has really got the battery kind of supply chain sorted out. So there is potential for them to be a very, very, very big player. Whether it justifies this valuation, who knows? But I think that's kind of the punt. People want to... And this was a, a frenzy, but it was a frenzy, I think, driven by people thinking, 
oh my god, this may be for real, I need to get in on it. Well, and Glenn, it raises at least in my mind two questions, which is, how big is this market going to be, and can Tesla maintain its lead? Because they're clearly well, ahead of everybody else. Can other people catch up, or if they got such a lead, people can't catch up? Well, that's the issue. I mean, Tesla has had good news recently, the lower costs of batteries, I think has been a big plus, its own operational improvements. But you have to make a big macro and micro bet. So the macro bet is, this is going to dominate cars going forward, period, full stop, and do so quickly. The micro bet, as you said, is can no one catch up with Tesla? You have to believe both of those things. Let's remember Tesla's market cap now is more than GM, Ford, and Fiat Chrysler yes, combined, yes. despite that they sell a minuscule fraction of the cars. That's clearly very frothy. But I think the macro bet seems sound to me. The micro bet that no other car company can catch that's where investors may want to spend some time. And Sandy, I wonder how much of the macro bet is really China. Uh, because China was the ones that they said, we're going to go to electric vehicles. They've got a huge emissions problem there. And uh, so the rest of the world, Europe, and then certainly the United States, has sort of been caught behind that, driving that demand. I think that is a large part of the micro bet. And I think that, you know, Tesla's move there and Tesla's you know, yeah. position there is, is, a, is a lot of what's driving this enthusiasm. I think part of the micro bet, however, is one about there isn't going to be another disruptive technology to, to kind of prevent EVs dominating for the foreseeable future. I think that's, you're, you're making several macro bets. That's one. You're also assuming that, you know, they have a head start on batteries and that is going to lead to, you know, serious production and serious dominance. You know, maybe. I mean, you know, I've, I've, I think I've learned to not underestimate Elon Musk. I mean, he, he is a pretty extraordinary individual. <laughs> By the, way, the short sellers of, of Tesla yeah, stock have also to. learned and that I, this I, week. So, so exactly. And so, you know, he is, I, I think, a transformational figure. It is extraordinary what it's done, what this company has done. Nonetheless, this kind of, you know, surge and then even fall back of the last week seems to me to be devoid. I agree, but energy. let's remember, transformational leaders often don't actually deliver at the end of the day. A visionary is not the same thing as an effective leader. You know, Alfred Sloan or Henry Ford would have been very different kinds of personalities from Elon Musk. So a lot to say well, about it, him that's it, positive. Exactly. But you could argue that Henry Ford was not really transformational in the way that Elon Musk was. He certainly was brilliant and he did things. Correct. But there was nothing that he'd sort of invented exactly. from scratch. Correct. Unlike Edison, for example, exactly. who was transformational. And what happened to him? Well, remember, Edison created great social value, but appropriated not that much of it for himself. Uh, so maybe Elon Musk does both. Maybe so. Well, maybe so. <laughs> that would be pretty extraordinary. It would drive up those Tesla, that Tesla <laughs> stock. Okay. Our contributors will be back with us in just a moment. Head to Bloomberg.com for more exclusive thoughts from our weekly contributors, along with full episodes and the official Bloomberg Wall Street Week podcast. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Welcome back to Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now for some closing thoughts from our contributors. I'm going to turn to Zanny first because I think you have a story in The Economist about CEOs. We do. I'll cover this week outside the U.S. In the U.S. we have the Democratic Party, but outside the U.S. it's how to be a CEO. Hmm. And uh, it, it's an interesting story. It's, but there's a big backing piece which is looking at the headhunting industry, but the actual, the, the, the cover editorial makes the point that um, to be a CEO now is not a bad job, right? The, you know, the median earnings for the CEO is 13 million for the Fortune 500 and S&P 500. That's median, not That average. is median, wow. 13 million a year. Um, so not a, and you also have much longer job tenure than people think you do. The risks of retiring or being fired are about 10% a year. It's not, it's not that high. Uh, but the nature of the job is changing. And one of the interesting things that I found in this piece was that traditionally CEOs wielded their power through their ability to allocate capital. Think of Jack Welch. Think of, you know, what you, you, you close a factory here, you open one here, you close a division here, you open one here. In a modern company where intangibles are so much more important, Capital allocation is no longer the kind of key disciplining tool you've got. It's a much more amorphous. Secondly, you know, you no longer, it's no longer fashionable just to work for the shareholders, right? You have stakeholders across the board. You've got to worry about your employees. You've got to worry society. You've got to worry about your customers. So it's become a much more amorphous job. And those two things together, I think, mean that, you know, the nature of being a CEO is changing. 
but I think judging by what we've got, it's still a pretty cushy thing so, to do. So, Glenn, as an economist, does that justify higher compensation? Because those people are more rare, and it's a difficult, they're, more difficult job. They're very rare, and there's a competitive market for their talents. I, I'm not sure I would describe it as cushy. It's actually <laughs> quite hard to be able to manage all those constituencies. I, I think of CEOs as people who are navigating disruption in their industries. They have to be strategic thinkers. They have to build strong teams, and they have to manage boards and shareholders and and uh, outside interests. I, I think it's not so easy to do. That $13 million do you think, is pretty do well you earned. Think, yeah, do you think CEOs deserve their compensation? I think if the market says that's the demand for CEO talent, then yes. Well, absolutely. but is the market influenced to some extent by who's on the compensation committee and who's on the board and the extent to which the CEO that has is, relations with them? That is commonly Glenn. said, but when you look at private equity CEOs who only have to deal with a very sophisticated private equity player, their compensation is also very, very high. So I think it's really the market. Okay, so let's talk about something that's really stirred up a lot of people in New York. I know certainly in my family, global entry. President oh, yeah. Trump, the Trump administration says we're going to cut you off if you're from New York, from global entry. I received word of that this morning. <laughs> and I'm about to make a, a trip overseas soon. Yes, it's, it's a rare action for the U.S. to do. And it's actually part of a more general strategy of going after sanctu so-called sanctuary cities and states uh, and their policies, so this may not be the last. Yeah, to, to explain it, I guess, a little bit, what their rationale is, if you're letting these people in, these undocumented aliens, they may be more dangerous, and you're not vetting them sufficiently, so uh, New Yorkers, we don't trust quite as much, because you might have some of those coming in and out of the country. I guess that must be the, the logic. I, I hope I'm a trustworthy soul in glo global entry. And of course, the machines are broken a lot anyway. <laughs> so I have a slight schadenfreude here. I mean, I think global entry, the ability to, to sign up to this program and then come very quickly through U.S. Uh, Border control is a tra has been transformational for me. It's amazing. I used to spend as long with everybody else who didn't wasn't a U.S. citizen. You know, hours and hours in the queue. Um, this is one of the few occasions where. The administration has picked on New York and not foreigners, so I have to say I'm delighted about this. If you're going to do, I'm not. It's not very good policy, but <laughs> well, it, it is one actually oddly that doesn't doesn't uh, affect us. If you're but Glenn, I'm curious about the politics of it. I mean, you served in a Republican administration, and uh, traditionally Republicans have believed that states should have some autonomy in deciding how they handle their citizens. This is basically the federal government in Washington dictating to New York how it should handle its citizens. That's not normally what I think of as as a Republican position. It's not normally, but let's also remember that the actual issue of terrorism is a big deal. And this is going to be a continued discussion between states and the federal government. I think the administration is went it, too far. Is this really, but is this really that, is it a sort of serious policy? So isn't it just the president saying, New York, you know, yeah. I mean, Get stuff. As an election yeah. coming, I mean, we had this, the, the state and local tax, the SALT thing that really hit New York, Connecticut, California. Is it just coincidence that those states really didn't vote for him? He's not going to lose a lot of voters in those states. He's not, but the state and local tax deduction is something that economists have talked about. It's a long time. I'm a New Yorker, so you know it, it hits me. But frankly, it was still good policy. Yeah, it was. It, that was good policy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there you have it. Many thanks to our contributors, Glenn Hubbard and Zanny Minton Beddoes. This has been another edition of Wall Street Week. See you next week.